the church as you encourage one another, you build one another up, which is why three or four times a year we talk about small groups. At our church, we're all about relationships. And if you heard Reva talk as she opened the service, if you heard Pastor David, who so eloquently put it, um, we need one another, and we believe sincerely this isn't just something we say. We believe rows are good. The rows you're in now are awesome, but circles are better. Circles are so much better because in circles, that's where life change happens. Life, life change happens within the context of relationships. Relationship happens face-to-face -face in circles, not in rows. I got a short video I want to share with you, and it's a really short one, and they're going to get it ready as they get that ready because someone grabbed the lights back there. for. I don't think we need lights. It's not a big deal. And, and as they get that video ready, I was going to let you know that as I walk through the second interrupted me was that <laughs> I forgot what I was saying uh, circles hold on a second circles are better than rows that's right I said that 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 this relationship you build in the circle is going to be something that's going to be incredible for your life and I, I'm going to build a case for that and as I'm building this case if you get tired or you get annoyed by my voice or you get you argue with me that's fine in your bulletin you have a TLC catalog read that instead of listening last night my wife was really tired and she fell asleep during my message and, and that just like broke my heart I was kidding <laughs> I'm putting her on blast. Just kidding. But um, if you do get bored, read that, read that catalog. Read through it. Be praying about maybe where God wants to send you. And, and I just want to say a disclaimer, and I always say this, but I want to make sure you hear this because some of the things I'm going to share today, there's a lot of ways of interpreting it, and I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm trying to say. So this is always a guilt-free zone. We believe in a positive faith. We believe in good news, great news. So as, as I'm talking, please don't think we're trying to condemn or point fingers or anything like that at all. We just feel this is an important area to discuss, and we want to do that together with all of you. So for the last three to four weeks, in fact, the last 26 days, me and some friends of mine and some of you even in the church have been in the time machine. And what that means is that you've been reading through the book of Proverbs. Uh, January 1st, we read Proverbs chapter 1. January 2nd, so on and so forth. We've been reading through the time machine because we want this year, 2014, we want God to give us wisdom in the choices we have to make, in the decisions we have to make. We want God to lead us and to guide us. And we felt that getting in this time machine, soaking ourselves, saturating ourselves in wisdom would be the first step towards finding out what God wants for me, what God wants for you, for your family. So we've been reading through Proverbs. And I read a few other books on my um, recovery time. And one of the books I read in a message I preached uh, I think two or three years ago here was, what's the best question we could ask? If we're having to make a decision, if we're faced with alternatives, if we're in a fork in the road and we have to know which way to go, one of the best questions you can ask, one of the questions that's going to reduce your stress, it's going to reduce the number of tears you cry, it's going to reduce um, all sorts of regrets and all sorts of things, one of the best questions you could ask is this, simply put, in this case, in this decision, what is the wise thing for me to do? What's the wise thing for me to do? Not what's the right thing to do because I can convince myself other people can get into gray areas. Not what's the least I can get by because that leads to a slippery slope. Not even what's the legal thing to do because there's some things we know will be wrong even if they are legal. But in this situation, in this decision I have to make, what's the wise thing for me to do? 
in light of my past experience, in light of my current circumstances, and in light of my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do? So I've been asking myself that question. As I've been going through the time machine, reading through the books of prophets, I've been asking God, God, what's the wise thing for me to do? And from that, one of the themes that just stood out as I read through Proverbs was this idea of time. Time. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about your time, about my time. And here's a verse in the Bible. This is in Job chapter 14, verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. A person's Days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Somehow, God has determined how much time you have. And if you're not a believer yet, you're not sure about this whole God thing, that's okay. But even all of us, we can agree that our time is limited. There's not an infinite amount of time we have. Our time is running out and it's limited. So put it another way. You can overeat. You can overspend. You can overachieve. You can never, never overlive. Your time is limited. That's something we don't have control of. We can't count how much time we have left. We can count so many other things, but we can't count how much time we have left, which means your time is the most valuable asset you have because it's limited. It's valuable. There's nothing you have that's more valuable than your time. You can count friends. You can count money. You can't count your time. So if there was ever an area where we needed to get in the time machine, where we needed to ask this question, what's the wise way to spend my time? It's regarding time because it's the most valuable time. Some of us, we can look back and we say, man, I can't believe in that season of my life, that time of my life, how much I wasted my time or how I misspent my time or how I, you know, gave away so much of my time. So what's the wise way for us to spend our time? And again, if you're not quite a believer there, this is going to be a beneficial message for you anyways because this is just wisdom. But for those of you who are followers of Jesus, if you're a disciple, if you're someone who's saying, I want to follow Jesus to the best of my abilities, this issue, this question, it's a non-negotiable. Because what we Christians, what we're supposed to believe is that every good and perfect gift comes from God. That means that all the time I've been giving, all the opportunities that I have, they were given to me. They were given to you by God. And it's a stewardship issue. It's for us to figure out how am I going to steward, how am I going to manage my time. So to bring all of us on the same page so that we're on the right track and we're, we're on the right way, I want to give you four observations about time. And then I want to look at this passage in Scripture that's going to speak to us about time. So these four observations, you can follow along in your handout. I got a PowerPoint, whatever you feel comfortable. These are kind of obvious. Um, when I say them, they're going to be kind of intuitive. They're going to make sense to you. Um, but for lots of reasons, I we probably, we ignore these um, observations. So let me start from the beginning. Number one, the first observation about time is this. Investing small amounts of time over time is cumulative. Investing small amounts of time over time is cumulative. That means that if you invest a little bit of time, you make a deposit, an investment, an installment of, of something over time, it's going to add up to something. Here's an example. You make a decision. I'm going to work out 30 minutes a day, day after, three times a week, right? 30 minutes a day, three times a week, week after week, year after year. All of that exercise adds up to something. It's cumulative. It builds up to something. If you make a decision, I'm going to learn how to play a musical instrument. I'm going to practice this instrument 30 minutes a day, three times a week, week after week, year after year. That builds up to something. You, at the end, you have something to show for it. It's cumulative. It adds up. If you make a decision as a family, we're going to eat dinner together as a family three times a week, 
week after week, year after year, that adds up to something. It builds up to something. At the end of it, you have something to show for it. You have a strong relationship with your kids, a deeper, a closer relationship with your kids because you made small deposits of time over time. Your relationship with God, you make a decision, I'm going to connect with God every single day, or in the morning, in the evening, whenever. Even if it's a few minutes, if you make that decision, over time, that builds up to something. Even if it's a small amount of time, you connecting with God day after day, week after week, year after year, that adds up to something. If you make the decision, I'm going to plug into a small group and I'm going to make a habit of meeting weekly and opening my life up to people and allowing them to open their lives up to me. If you do that week after week, year after year, that adds up to something. Like Reva and, and David both said, their lives were changed. It added up. It was cumulative. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Time after time builds up, but no single installment, no one deposit is really that significant. If you miss one time, it's not that big a deal, which is why it's so easy to skip working out, right? You can say to yourself, oh, I'm not going to work out today, I'll do next day. And really, you're right. Missing one workout, if you're working out three times a week, it's not that big a deal. Nothing's really going to happen. Think of it this way. I haven't worked out, if you haven't worked out for years, and suddenly you go to the gym one time for 30 minutes, that next week, don't expect anyone to say, wow, you've been working out, right? It doesn't work. One installment in, in itself is really insignificant. But that installment over time, consistently, that's what makes the difference. So here's the main point. It's very simple. In the key areas of your life, in the most important areas of your life, your family, your health, your walk with God, your fellowship with the people here, in the most important areas of your life, it's consistent deposits of time over time that make all the difference. Consistent deposits of time over time that make all the difference. So, observation number two. Not only are consistent deposits of time over time cumulative, neglect is cumulative as well. Neglect is cumulative also. So here's what that means. If I make a decision in 2014, I am not going to work out at all. And that's my goal. I write that in the mirror. Ray will not work out three times a week, week after week, year after year. At the end of those years, guess what? It adds up to something, right? I'm going to have something to show for it. If I make a decision, I'm going to eat very, very unhealthy. I'm going to eat at McDonald's three times, sorry, McDonald's, three times a week, week after week, year after year. You know what you have? A documentary called, whatever it's called, I forget what it's called. Supersize me, supersize me, that's right. Okay. It adds up to something. Neglect adds up to something as well. Think about it like this. If you make a decision, I'm going to neglect my family day after day, week after week, year after year, it adds up to something. It adds up to a distant relationship. It adds up to kids where you don't really know them and they don't really know you. If you make a decision, I'm going to neglect my spiritual life with God. I'm just going to drop out of church. I'm going to drop out of uh, small groups. I'm going to drop out of this. I'm just going to ignore God day after day, week after week, month after month. That adds up to something as well. It's cumulative. At the end of that time, you're going to have something to show for it. And here's the problem. Neglect is easy. Neglect is so easy. It's so easy to say, ah, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to work out this one time. I'm not going to eat. I'll eat unhealthy one time. I'll miss one Sunday. I'll miss one group. I'll miss this one prayer time. And it's easy to do that. And we're not lying. It is insignificant that one time. But it adds up. It builds up. It becomes a habit. And we ignore and we ignore. We neglect and we neglect. And at the end of the day, neglect is easy. Neglect is also costly. It's very costly. Because after ignoring your family for year after year, it's going to be costly. Ignoring your health year after year after year, at the end of the day, it's going to be costly. Ignoring your faith, ignoring your relationship with one another, at the end of the day, it's going to be costly. So, 
It's always easier to neglect, but it's always costly, especially in the key areas of our life. Instead of neglect, we need consistent deposits of time over time. Number three, random has no cumulative value at all. Random doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't add up to anything. Think of it like this. If on this hand you put working out three times a week, 30 minutes a day, week after week, year after year, this is going to add up to something. It's cumulative. It adds up. But if on this hand you put everything else you opted for instead of working out, you have nothing because random doesn't add up to anything. At the end of the day, you have nothing to show for it. Here's another way of putting it. There is no cumulative value in the random things we opt for instead of the important things. So think about it like this. What did you do this last year instead of eating dinner with your family? You caught up on sports on ESPN. You uh, played a video game. You cro solved a crossword puzzle. You played an extra round of golf. You went shopping for an extra 30 minutes. At the end of the day, you know what that adds up to? Nothing, because random has no cumulative value. And lots of times when we ask ourselves, what did I do instead of exercise? What did I do instead of connect with God? What did I do instead of go to church? What did I do instead of plug into a group? There's nothing to show for it because we neglected the important things and we did random things and random add up to nothing. So then number four and our final observation is this, and this is the one that's well, the hardest for me to come to grips with, but it's so true. In the areas of our lives that matter most, in the areas of your life that are the most important, you can't make up for misspent time. In the areas of your life that matter most, you can't make up for misspent time. Another way of putting it, when the areas of your life that matter most, you can't cram. You can't pull all-nighters. When I was a college student, I did all-nighters all the time, and all-nighters worked sometimes, not all the times. Do you guys remember what an all-nighter was? It's when you've had months, weeks to do an assignment, a project, an essay, something, and you just ignored it. Oh, do it. Neglect is easy. You ignored it, and suddenly it's tomorrow. It's due tomorrow. And you wake up, you're like, what am I going to do? So you make a big pot of coffee, you get no dose, and you stay up all night, 5, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning working. And as you're working all night, you're humming in your head, C's get degrees, C's get degrees, all I need to see. And then you take your test and you do a horrible job, but you get a C and you got your degree and it worked and you're here today. And in some areas of life... All-nighters semi kind of work, right? If you have a presentation to give tomorrow and you stay up all night, you can give that presentation and it might work. If you have a meeting you need to prepare for, you can stay up all night and it might work. But the way God made the world in the areas that matter most, all-nighters do not work. You can't cram for the areas that matter most. Imagine this. I don't work out for years, and I go to a gym, and I say, you know what? I'm going to make up for not working out these last couple of years. So I'm not going to work out for 30 minutes. I'm not going to work out for one hour. I'm going to work out for eight hours straight. I'm going to do every single machine in this gym. I don't care if I don't know what they mean or what they do. I'm going to use them anyways. Or let's say you haven't jogged forever, and you say, I'm not going to jog a quarter mile a mile. I'm going to jog a marathon. What's going to happen the next day? The next day, you're going to wake up and your body is going to send you a message. And it's a simple message. It's going to say, you're an idiot. What were you thinking? This hurts. Ow. Because we can't cram for our health. Because in the areas that matter most, you can't pull all-nighters. You can't cram for them. So for your family, you can't cram for misspent time with your family. You can't just ignore your family, neglect your family, neglect those important relationships, and then one Saturday wake up and say, kids, sit around this breakfast table. We're going to sit here for eight hours straight, making up for these last few months that I skipped dinner with you. That's going to do more damage to your kids and to yourself eight hours straight. It doesn't work that way because in the key areas of your life, it's consistent deposit of time over time. That's what makes all the difference. That's what wisdom is. That's what makes sense. In the most important areas of your life, you can't cram. 
You don't cram for a healthy family. You can't cram for a healthy marriage. You can't cram for a healthy relationship with your kids. You can't cram for health. And most importantly, you can't cram for your spiritual relationship with God. It doesn't work that way. You can't just ignore God, neglect God, neglect your faith, neglect all of that, and then show up one Sunday and say, you know what? I'm going to go to church Saturday night. I'm going to go to 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. I'm going to go to singles. I'm going to join four different small groups to make up and cram for your walk with God. It doesn't work that way. That's the way God made the world to work. In the most important areas of your life, C's don't get degrees. You can't pull all-nighters. You can't cram, which is why there are no shortcuts for your relationship with God. There's no shortcuts with your relationship with your family. There's no shortcut for your health. That's the way it works. So if this is all true, if these observations are true, and I know some of you might argue with some of the finer points, details, that's okay. But I think in general, we would all agree that these are obvious, they make sense. I might have not thought about it that way, but it's true. That's the way it works. If this is true, then what would God have to say to us about how we spend our time? If there is a God who's our Heavenly Father, who cares so deeply about each and every one of us, if that God who created you and has your best interests at heart, what would he have to say to you about how you spend your time? What would he say to us about time? If time is our most valuable asset, if time is limited and valuable and we need to figure out how to leverage it, what would God say to us about that? See, that's what's so awesome about the Bible, which is why we always say go home and read the Bible. Don't cram and read all night. Just slow, consistent deposits of time. But the Bible, we don't have to wonder. The Bible tells us, God tells us in the Bible exactly how we need to manage our time. So if you go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, God speaks to the apostle Paul, and Paul writes this down. Verse 15, here's what he says. He says, therefore, in light of what we've been talking about. Therefore, be careful. Be careful how you walk or be careful how you live, depending on what version you have. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Don't live as the unwise. Ask the question, what's the wise thing for me to do? Live as wise. And then look at the next phrase. Paul could have chosen any number of areas to apply this principle to. But look what he chooses. Making the most of your time. Your time. That's what Paul applies this principle to. Be careful how you live. Don't live as an unwise. Live as wise. Taking advantage of making the most of your time. Because Paul understood what we understand. That time is our most valuable asset. That it's limited. That our time equals our life. And Paul is saying, hey, take advantage of it. He says making the most. And literally in the Greek, it's the word for redeeming. Or getting as much value out of. Redeeming the time. Getting as much as you can out of your time. So he says, don't be as unwise. Don't be reckless with your time. Don't be random with your time. Don't be haphazard with your time. Don't be unintentional with your time. Don't just drift and let culture of this world tell you how to use your time. Don't pull all-nighters. Instead, be wise with your time. Why? Why is this such a big deal? And Paul answers us. He says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. And that's a strange phrase, and it could mean all sorts of things. The... the Meaning I think it has based on some commentaries I read is, is that Paul's referring to the culture and the time in which he lived, which is true for us today. He's saying that if I choose to spend my time the way culture tells me to spend my time, if I choose to spend my time the way my appetites tell me to spend my time, at the end of the day, I'm going to have nothing to show for it. It's going to be of no value. I'm going to waste my time. I'm going to misspend my time. Because culture and my appetite, they focus on the now, not on the later. They're focused on today, not on eternity. They're focused on here and not on the rest, the big picture of what God has. 
So culture, my appetite, it tells me, eh, it doesn't matter if you miss today. It doesn't matter if you miss church today. It doesn't matter if you miss group tonight. It doesn't matter if you pray tonight. It doesn't matter if you eat in a healthy tonight. It doesn't matter if you skip working out tonight. Because one deposit, it's really not that significant. And it's true. But that missing becomes a habit. And if I allow culture, if I allow my appetites to just lead me, it's going to lead me down the, down the road, the path of misspending my time, which is why God, through Paul, says, be careful. Be careful. Be careful how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. Don't be as unwise thinking everything could be fixed tomorrow. I'll do it later. Be wise with your time. Ask yourself the question, what is the wise way for me to spend my time? So based on that passage, based on what I've been saying, here's the question that I want to give you. And it's the question that I've been wrestling with these last couple of weeks. I've shared it with my pastors. I've shared it with my family. We're talking about this. And I want you to do the same. I want you to have a conversation over lunch, over dinner, at some point, and talk with the people in your life and ask them this question. Here's the question. Where do you need to begin making consistent deposits of time? Where do you need to begin making consistent deposits of time? Another way of putting that, in what area of your life is God saying to you, hey, you're neglecting this area. I want you to start making consistent deposits of time in that area of life. What area of your life do you need to begin making consistent deposits of time? Is it your health? Is God saying, I want you to start exercising consistently, make consistent deposits of time in your health? Is it what, the way you eat? Is it your family? Is God saying, I want you to spend consistent time with your family? Is it your marriage? Is God saying, I want you to spend consistent time with your marriage? Is, is it your walk with God? Is God calling you to a deeper walk and saying, hey, I want to connect with you on a daily basis. Even if it's for a few minutes, start making consistent deposits of time over time because that's going to make all the difference. In all of these areas of your life, that's what makes the difference. So where is it you, not your neighbor, not your spouse, not your family, but you, just think about you for a second. Where is it you need to begin making consistent deposits of time over time? In light of your past experience, in light of your current circumstance, in light of your future hopes and dreams, where is it you need to begin making consistent deposits of time over time? Because that's what's going to make all the difference. Now, I'm going to bring all this back around to small groups because this is our TLC Sunday. Now, this is why a few times a year we push small groups. We invite you to join. We ask you, we challenge you to take a step and join a group of maybe they're going to be weird, maybe they're not going to be weird, and just make that kind of gamble with your life. Here's why I, we do that. Because small groups, TLCs, you know what they are? They are a consistent deposit of time over time in your faith. They're consistent deposits of time over time in your relationships. So normally speaking, going to one TLC isn't going to revolutionize your life, and you might get nothing out of it. But that doesn't matter because consistent deposit of time over time, that's what makes all the difference. And that's what the story of David and Reva and my story and all these other people's stories are, is that they made a decision, a, a, an intentional, conscious decision. I'm going to invest time in these relationships. I'm going to make a habit of opening my life to these people and allowing them to open up their lives to me. I'm going to, and in this context, life is going to happen. God's going to change me. God's going to speak to me. And that's why we push TLC. So maybe what God is saying to you is you can't cram for your faith. You can't cram for relationships. So are you willing to make a consistent deposit of time over time in your faith, in your relationships, by joining a TLC. That's why we have the catalog. That's why we have information in the foyer. So pray about it. Think about it. Maybe that's where God's asking you to do that.
Let me finish with a couple stories of, of what happened to me. When I first became a Christian, I was 14 years old, very young, a lot younger than I am now. And when I was 14, my pastor gave me a Bible. And, and my personality is I just love binging. I love going on, like, if I get a book, I'll start reading at 9 and just stay up all night reading the book. If I like a show, I'll watch 30 episodes straight, right? Um, well, when I got the Bible, I was like, he's like, right, read the Bible. I'm like, oh, perfect. I'll just start reading now. I'll finish it. I won't have to read the Bible the rest of my life. Awesome. Check. One thing done. What's next? That's just what I was thinking. My pastor was like, no, don't do that. Right. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to read three chapters a day. And I said, that's it? Three chapters? I can do that in a couple minutes. Like, no, just three chapters. What about three books a day? Nope. Three chapters a day, every day. Day after day, week after week, year after year. And there are sometimes I read the chapters, three chapters, and I got nothing out of it. It was so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. I was like, I don't care who begat who. And some chapters, some days, the three chapters were amazing, and they just spoke to me and brought me to my knees. And it was so clear God had something to say to my life. That was 20 years ago. So give or take a few chapters, that's about 7,120 chapters of the Bible that I've read and reread. And that has been cumulative. That's built up to something. That's added up to something. That means that now I have a better understanding of who God is, of why he made me, of what, my plan, what his plan is for my life. It's all built up to a stronger faith. I feel like my faith is on the rock. So when I face crisis and travesties and I see things that shouldn't be in the world, I can, I can get through it because I have a stronger faith with my Heavenly Father. It built up to something. Small deposits of time over time. A few years later, I was in college. I was a different pastor now. I moved away. And when I was in college, uh, my pastor said, Ray, you do a great job of studying the Bible by yourself on your own. I want you to plug into a small group. And I told my pastor, honestly, I'm like, listen, pastor, here's the thing. I'm smarter than the average person and I don't want to join a small group and be surrounded by dummies who don't know the first thing about anything. That's just not what I want to do. I had a lot of issues back then, by the way. <laughs> so he said, just try it. So I tried. I got plugged into a small group. Even the people who weren't as smart as me, no, I'm just they were smarter than me. And it was awesome. It was like the best thing. It was the first time in my whole Christian life. It was, I had been a Christian for five years at that point. The first time I read the Bible with other people and I had them talk with me. And they were asking the same questions I was asking. They were worried about the same things I was worried about. And it was such an awesome experience. It was like a catalyst for my faith that I can't quite put into words. 17 years later, I'm still in small groups, and I love speaking here on a weekly basis, but my favorite time of the week is when I get to connect in circles, where face-to-face -face people can ask me how I'm doing. They can pray for me, and I can pray for them, because that's what happens over time. That has built up to something. It's been cumulative, consistent deposit of time over time. So here's what I know. In some areas of your life, if you don't make consistent deposits of time over time, you're not going to be able to make up for it later. You can't cram for it later. So from this day forward, don't worry about yesterday. Don't worry about last month or last year, the last 20 years, 30, 50, it doesn't matter. From this day forward, from today, from this moment on, I'm going to be wise. I'm going to use my time wisely. Now is the time to begin. Remember, guilt-free zone. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. From now on, what area of your life do you need to make consistent deposits of time over time? Therefore, be careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most. Taking full advantage of this most valuable asset God's given you. Time. Would you stand with me? I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Thank you, God, so much for this great gift you've given us. Every single one of us here have time. That's like the one thing we all have in common right now. We have time, this valuable, priceless asset. And we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to mismanage it. We don't want to look back at season and say, oh, what a waste. We want to take advantage of it. If this is a gift you've given us, we want to live it to the fullest. So what's the wise way for us to spend our time? Father, I pray that as we consider that question of where we need to begin making consistent deposits of time, 
that you would speak to us, that you would show us exactly what area of our life we need to start making deposits and then give us the strength and the courage to do it even when it's hard because the neglect is easy, but it's also costly. And Father, as we think about and process joining a small group, getting back into a small group, would you give us the courage as well to do it, to make that step, to make this consistent deposit of time in our faith and in our relationships? We'll never stop thanking you. We're praying for you know, miracles to take place in our family this week. And you let me pray, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We're so glad you're here.